This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. Camera rolling and action. Hello, everyone. We are here with Bigfoot investigator and television host Pat Pennypincher. Pat, tell us, why did you ask that we meet you all the way out here? It's simple, really. This area has a long history of sightings, reports going back decades. Have you actually seen the beast yourself, Pat? On a monthly basis. A monthly basis? That's incredible. Look, here comes one now. Delivery for Pat Pennypincher. That's me. Thank you. What's that? And why did a mailman just deliver a package to you in the middle of the forest? This is my cryptid crate. It's a monthly box subscription filled with all kinds of Bigfoot-related items. Each month, a new box arrives packed with amazing cryptid-themed items. All I had to do was go to www.cryptidcrate.com to sign up. Wait a minute. Is this the encounter you were describing? Look at this t-shirt. Awesome! I've never read this book before, and it's autographed. Look at this awesome patch. Holy cow, these stickers are amazing! I've been waiting to watch this documentary, and this is the coolest figurine. A Sasquatch watch. All right, cut it, fellas. We're done here. It's even got fur on it. This is unbelievable. Welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. Thank you for tuning in this evening. I am pleased as punch to have you all here. Now before we get started tonight, I have something I want to share with all of you. This past week, I went to Ohio. Up until now, I've kept the purpose of my visit to myself. But after my experience, I thought it was important for me to share the reason for my trip. Most of you know that back in September, my little brother took his own life. Coincidentally, a high school nearby my hometown decided to put on a suicide prevention 5K, and my family and I decided we should participate in memory of my brother. The fundraiser was a huge success. It raised thousands of dollars for local suicide prevention groups, and all was well. But I couldn't stop thinking about not only the fundraiser, but the events leading us to participate in that event. So that leaves me with this message. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression and or mental disorders, and you suspect that they may take their own life, please take action. Never leave that person alone. Always check in, and above all else, please urge them to seek help. And if you are one of those people struggling, one of those entertaining thoughts of taking their own life, please listen to the following quote that was plastered everywhere during the 5K. Suicide does not take away the pain. It merely transfers it to someone else. And I can assure you that every word of that quote is true. Every single word. I will end with this. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression and or thoughts of self-harm, call this toll-free number. 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. A255. If this little message keeps only one family from experiencing the life-shattering pain that my family has experienced, then this message is well worth the two minutes that it's taken up. All right, thank you for allowing me to share that important message. Now, let's get on with tonight's show. I 
I have a great program lined up for you guys tonight, calls spanning nearly every paranormal genre. So without further ado, let's launch into our first call. Up first is a call that touches on one of my favorite subjects in the paranormal field. This is Dana's call from the state of New York. Hi Derek, um, this is Dana from Brooklyn, New York, and I was just calling in about a sighting I had from when I was a child. Um, so my grandparents owned a farmhouse on a plot of land in Northeast Ohio, specifically Ashtabula off of Lake Erie. And during the summers, me and my mom would go from Louisiana and visit them during the summer. And so around 1993 to 1995, roughly, um, I was around 7 to 10-ish, um, we decided to take my grandparents to in town to play bingo. We only had one car at the time we were using, their old Dodge car. And um, so we went back home and we hung out and we had to go pick them up around 11, 11.30, it was very late, or at least to me as a kid, it was very late at night. So at that time, around 11 to midnight, we go head out to pick them up. And the area they lived in was, like I said, an old farmhouse. And so there's a dirt road with gravel. Each house is like a mile apart. There's no street lights. There's no lights anywhere it's pitch black the houses are pretty much like a mile from the road less than a mile but pretty far off from the road and it, it's just all woods there's nothing there wasn't even cable out there there was barely we had the telephone lines nothing so we get in the car we're driving my mom's driving and not more than like 30 seconds after getting on the actual road and heading out, something runs across the light um, in the road. The Basically, it's so dark that like you could only see what was in the headlight, um, and that's it. And there's woods on each side, with the exception of people's plots of land, but it was so far back, like I said, there was no lights, it's just pitch black. And so this huge black cat runs across the front of us. Um, it was really big. It pretty much stretched across the road and it was pretty much like maybe a one and a half lane, if that makes sense, road where you'd have to pull over for the other person to come down. Um, it was just a huge black cat, a panther. It, it wasn't a dog. It pretty much had them same muscle type and length and just like long limbs of a panther um, and it was pitch black and it was ran across in front of the car maybe 10 20 feet and went from one side of the woods to the other and my mom slammed on the brakes and we were both just pretty much stunned she like screamed and told me to lock the door um, yeah and we just we drove away and we didn't really mention it to my grandparents because we didn't want to freak them out since it's their home and within a few minutes of their home there was this huge black seemingly black cat black panther um in their area and so we didn't mention it to anyone i know my mom did call the police the next day to ask if maybe there was like a zoo had lost an animal or somebody, somebody, I, I don't know, something happened, but nothing happened. And so, yeah, we never seen it again, nothing like it. It was just very scary. And I know other people have called in and I think you had mentioned yourself. So yeah, that was it. I have other stories, more like paranormal-ish, superstitious calls but I'll do that at a later time. And um, thank you for the show. You're great. Thank you, Dana. The funny thing about this story is that it takes place a mere two hour drive and only a few years after my sighting. And I should note that the description Dana gave was identical to the creature that I saw. We touch on these types of calls all the time on the show, 
so there's really nothing I can say about it that I haven't already, other than that I'd love to hear experiences like this, and with a little luck, one of these days we might finally get a definitive answer as to what these mysterious and beautiful animals actually are. Thank you again, Dana, for taking the time to share your experience. Our next call takes us south. This is Emery's call from Texas. Hey, my name is Emery. Uh, I live out of Alamo, Texas. Uh, my particular experience took place back in 2000. I believe it was 2002. Uh, during springtime around April, March, around tax season, um, during that particular time, I had a friend named Scooter. Uh, his dad had his, got his income tax and gave him all types of money to buy whatever he wanted. He bought himself a car, uh, a guitar, and a, a pool table. But uh, anyways, uh, the reason why I bring that up, we... We end up uh, piecing that pool table together one night, particular night. And, um, uh, with my friend Scooter, his cousin Thomas, he's a little bit older than us at the time. He was about 28. Uh, me and Scooter were 19. And anyways, we set up that pool table that night and we decided to bless that table the right way. We had Thomas go buy some beers, and uh, we, we finished setting up the pool table at his grandma's house. That's where Scooter lived at the time. Um, towards the end of the night, we got tired of playing pool, smoking cigarettes in the garage. Decided to step out front, front in front of his house, finish smoking our cigarettes, and. Uh, as we're going back in, Scooter's uh, grandma's house had a long hallway to the left-hand side when you enter the the living room area. And at the end of the hallway, I saw in my peripheral a black mass, about six foot tall, swoop into Scooter's room, and I didn't mention much of it. Um, about until about 10, 15 minutes later. We're back in the garage, and I, I mentioned to Scooter and Thomas, say, uh, I saw a shadow go in your room, and they kind of laughed, scoffed at me, and, like, and said, you know what, if you see anything at our grandma's house, uh, you know, try not to flip out because uh, our grandma's house is haunted. I'm like, wow, okay. And I didn't know about that, so... All right, it's getting late, about 2, 3 o'clock uh, in the morning, and I couldn't go home. Still too young to drink anyways, and I asked Scooter if I could crash out on the floor in the room, his room. He gives me a pillow and blanket, and about an hour or so into the, uh, shoot, sleeping, I wake up with cotton mouth because we had been drinking earlier that night, and I hear a voice at the corner of the room come from that doorway uh, where I saw the that shadow or that black mass enter. And the voice goes, hey, you, real raspy-like. And, of course, uh, my first reaction was to pull the covers over my head. I'm like, oh, my goodness, man. I'm, that was the same shadow I'm thinking in my head. That's that shadow, man, that's talking to me, whatever it is. And I'm laying there under the blankets and freaking out for about five minutes. And all of a sudden, uh, Scooter's mic stand. He had a mic stand with a, because he was a little, he was a punk rock singer. He liked to play guitar and play music on the side. And yeah, his mic stand had fallen and hit my, across my chest. And I peeked out the blanket and uh, I could see that Scooter was still laying on his bed. And, uh, the street light was shining and I could still see he was laying there and there's no possible way that he could have done that so oh man this thing the shadow guy whatever the hell it was uh, could move things and we made that first the voice 
then that mic falling on my chest, then I'm there there just freaking out, man. And seconds later after that mic fell on my chest, that mic stand, I hear a scooter um, sitting up and he's yelling on top of his lungs and yelling obscenities. He's lifting up his shirt and uh, I'm looking at him sitting up. And uh, he's got a, a small cut on his chest, and I, I'm like, what the heck? Uh, it was like a serrated um, steak knife, the one you'd use at a restaurant with a black candle, sit right next to him, and, and uh, I saw a small cut in his chest, and he starts yelling more obscenities. Get the f out of my room, whoever you are, get the f out of my room. And uh, that that pretty much was that that night. Uh, we, we stayed up, played some Tony Hawk. I think it was like Tony Hawk Pro Skater Three. The rest of that night, pretty crazy. Uh, there was plenty of uh, other experiences at the house. I do want to bring up with later future calls, and I do have other experiences as well that are creepy as hell, but. Show's awesome. Uh, thank you for having me uh, here. And shows the bomb dot com. Have a nice one. Thanks, Emery. This is a crazy story. So many incidents in such a short period of time. Now, of course, we get all kinds of shadow man calls on the show, but I have to be honest here. This one does not sound like a shadow man encounter, but rather something more akin to poltergeist activity. To my knowledge, I don't know of a single instance where a shadow person has been reported speaking, moving objects, or scratching people. Of course, that's not to say that it hasn't happened, but I simply can't think of a single occurrence where it has. But I have heard of countless poltergeist cases that describe activity exactly like this. Now, assuming that this is in fact something more poltergeisty in nature, I have a theory as to why it would suddenly become so active. This type of activity is often triggered by major changes in a home, a family split, a death, a birth, or even remodeling. So I'm wondering if the addition of the pool table was enough to anger this obviously troubled spirit, angering it to the point that it would lash out in ways that Emery described. Of course, this is all conjecture, and there is no real proof that any of this is fact, but it has been a long-held belief by many paranormal investigators. So please, Take all that with a grain of salt. Thank you again, Emery, for sharing this amazing story. Next up, we head to the Northeast for yet another hairy story out of the state of Vermont. This is Chris's written submission. Hey, Derek. I figured I would write this email so I don't miss any detail or jumble my words like I did in my previous call. This event takes place in the Green Mountains of Vermont just this last May. My friend and I decided to go on a spur of a moment camping trip. We drove deep into the Green Mountains on a county road, then traveled another 10 miles up a dirt road and parked at a makeshift campsite. We did not see any cars or anyone in the area we were in. So luckily, it was early in the season, so no one was out camping yet. We got to this campsite around dusk, set up camp, and started a small fire. As it got dark, we just listened to the frogs and crickets as they grew louder. We set up next to a logging road that was impassable by vehicle. And around 11 p.m., we decided to walk up this logging road with nothing but a flashlight and night vision monocular. We must have walked over a mile until we decided to just sit on a log and listen. If anyone knows the Vermont Green Mountains wilderness, it's extremely thick and almost impossible to navigate without being on a trail. After about two hours of sitting, we decided to walk back to the camp. At this point, I had stopped to retie my boot when I started to hear what sounded like someone talking. I quickly realized that it wasn't English, more like a mumbling. It sounded like it was about 100 yards away through the thicket. I knew right away that if this was someone playing a joke, that they would need some type of megaphone in order to project it that far and still be able to hear it clearly. It didn't have that raspy sound that loudspeakers would have, though. It sounded clear as day, like someone was talking five feet away from you, yet you knew it was upwards of 100 yards away. After listening to this mumbling for about 10 seconds, it abruptly stopped, and we heard nothing else from that point on. I looked at my friend, and the only thing that came out of his mouth was, holy sh**, what the f*** was that? 
We were pretty freaked out at this point. Freaked out to the point where, once we got back to camp, we packed up and drove the four hours home. I must have drove 50 miles an hour back down that dirt road, but something was telling me just to get the f out of there. I know we sound like two cowards, but if anyone knows that helpless feeling of being out in the middle of nowhere, they could relate. On our drive home, we were very open about what we heard. We hear about most people not wanting to talk about it, but we talked about it the entire ride home. We were pretty positive that we heard some type of chatter. After looking up multiple videos on supposable Bigfoot chatter, it sounded almost identical to what we heard. I was a pretty big skeptic before this. I'm an avid outdoorsman slash hunter, and I know the animals native to the Northwest. What we heard was nothing I've heard before. Needless to say, I don't go into the woods at night unarmed anymore. Well, that's my story. Hope you can use it. Love your show. Keep up the good work. Chris. Well, thank you, Chris. I believe the sound that Chris described sounded a little bit like this. There's two of them across the creek at the big rocks. It's a hard act to follow. They sound like he talks to others and they talk to each other. Yeah. That clip comes courtesy of Ron Moorhead and Al Berry via their album, The Sierra Sounds. Sounds they recorded of a purported Bigfoot in the Sierra Mountains of California in the 1970s. And, to be perfectly honest, if I heard these sounds while walking through the woods, I'd probably have reacted the same way that Chris did. I'd run. Thank you again, Chris, for that awesome submission. Our next two calls seem to share a lot of the same details, so I'm going to play them both back to back. The following calls are from TJ and Donald, respectively. Hi, Derek. TJ Strange from Salem, Alabama. Um, so, I'm a smoker, and thus I spend a lot of time outside. So, while I'm outside, I tend to stare up at the sky. And there's been numerous occasions where I've seen things that I didn't recognize and looked it up to find out it was Venus or a space station or even a satellite sometimes. Um, but I never really think alien most of the time when I see UFOs and to be honest in this case I'm not sure if it's alien or not but I was outside smoking a cigarette um, this was about eight years ago now in uh, 2010 and uh, as I'm smoking this cigarette I'm watching this orange light coming towards my house and uh, I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was some some sort of flying craft, maybe a drone or a plane or, or something like that. And uh, as it gets over my house, the light seems to do kind of a weird spin, swing thing where then the light is pointing down at me. And it's just kind of hanging there for a minute. I mean, not very long, probably 10 seconds or so, but it's just in one spot in the sky for about 10 seconds. And that's what piqued my interest. Like, I was looking at it thinking, you know, what, what kind of craft is this? But I couldn't hear any sound. And to my knowledge, there are no planes that can hover. Um, and I don't think it was a drone, but... I can't be 100% sure. Anyway, so the light points down at me for about 10 seconds, and then it moves on. And uh, there again, I'm just a little curious at, at this point. But about five seconds after this light has passed on, two military jets, fighter jets, come flying over my, my house. And this is about midnight 
and they're flying low enough in the night sky for me to tell that these are fighter jets. I can clearly see the lights on the top of them. I mean, they were very, very loud. They, they, they seemed like they were barely even above the trees. I mean, I'm sure they were higher than that, but the point is they were low enough that I could even see the top of things as they moved on, going in the same direction as the strange light. And that's honestly what caught my attention. Um, so I don't know very many things that can hover that would have a uh, spotlight on them aside from a helicopter, but it seems like if it was a helicopter, it would have made some sort of sound. And there again, the strangest part to me was the military fighter jets flying over directly afterwards. So this was a short story. Um, I know I've called you quite a few times already. I'm just trying to give you some stories to keep your awesome podcast going. So keep up the good work, and I'll you'll be hearing from me again with a few more stories. Thanks. Hey, Derek. This is Donald calling from uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and uh, my children and I were driving on. Uh, it was uh, April seventeenth of this year, twenty eighteen. We were driving up uh, towards um, North Myrtle Beach. We were taking, going towards a highway. And as we were coming up over a bridge, um, we saw a military aircraft, a large gray military aircraft, was uh, flying southbound towards like Charleston area. Then we noticed that it uh, banked a turn and then we lost sight of it for a minute. And as we uh, reached the top of the bridge, we cleared the trees, which was the uh, obstructing our view. And the plane was there, but it was just hovering. It wasn't moving anywhere. And when I say large airplane, it was fairly large. It was a bright, sunny day. It was around noon. The um, daylight was fantastic. We had probably, you know, a 10, 15 mile. Uh, field of vision easy um, and then we just kept looking at this thing and it stayed in the same position for a minimum of, of two minutes because my, myself I kept ga- like gazing back at it and my children did and uh, we went extra slow and other cars noticed it too and we're driving very slow looking at it and then uh, unfortunately we uh, continued on our trip and uh, on the return trip we came back and obviously it was not there anymore um, it was super freaky. I don't know of any large military aircraft that can hover that way. Um, you know, the Harrier is much smaller, and this thing was probably a, a large transport or a supply airplane. Um, and it was just uh, freaky to say the least. Anyway, uh, Derek, love the show. Um, thank you for having this format for everybody, and uh, have a great day. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, as Donald mentioned, there is a military jet called the AV-8B Harrier that does have the ability to take off and land vertically and can hover for short periods. But he does a decent job of debunking that as a plausible explanation, not to mention the fact that the craft was retired somewhere around 2015. But upon further research, I learned that there is a newer, larger jet with vertical takeoff and landing capabilities, the F-35B fighter jet. The F-35B, or as it's otherwise known as the Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II, is a newer, more sophisticated version of previous specialty craft. First developed in the early 2000s, this craft was officially put into service in August of 2016. And as of today, there are upwards of 300 of them currently in service. So perhaps this is simply what both TJ and Donald saw, a test flight of this modern marvel. That could explain the fighter jet escort described by TJ as well. Now, of course, I do not claim to be any kind of expert on military aircraft, so perhaps there is something I'm missing, but this certainly seems like a logical explanation to me. So thank you, Donald and TJ. I truly appreciate you taking the time to share your stories. Now, before I move on to our next call, I need to make this little announcement. We are quickly approaching the Season 5 finale, and just as I've done over the past few seasons, 
I want to revisit the Hometown Legend segment. So if your town, county, or state has an urban legend or strange origin story, I want to hear it. Simply call the hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-6444. And be sure to mention that this is a Hometown Legend submission before starting the story. You can also submit via the Report Your Sightings tab on the website, which is www.monstersamonguspodcast.com. Time is getting short, so submit your spooky legend today. Now our next story is one submitted via that Report Your Sightings tab. This is an anonymous call submitted from an unknown location. Hello Derek, I love your podcast. I found it about three weeks ago and have been binge listening to several seasons already. I have a couple of stories that I can share. Here's the first. My dad, who has since passed away, was not the type of person who would tell fabricated stories. So when he told me this story when I was 12, I believed him. It haunted me for a while, then I forgot about it for decades. That is, until I started listening to Monsters Among Us. In the early 1960s, my dad was an able seaman with the Royal Canadian Navy stationed on the HMCS Cornwallis. He was on night watch duty one night when the ship was anchored. And I'm sorry, I do not know where that was. The night was moonlit, partly cloudy, and the waters were calm. My dad was on the deck when he heard oars slicing through the water. He looked over the guardrails and he could plainly see a rowboat. A man was rowing and a woman sitting across from the man facing him. My dad called out to them, Hello, what are you two doing way out here this time of night? Neither of them answered and the man kept rowing. Puzzled, as he was not sure why they would be so far from land so late at night, he watched them briefly until clouds moved overhead and blocked the moon. When the moon moved out from under the cloudy veil, the rowboat and the occupants were gone. So what was that? A visual echo? Thank you. Well, thank you for that submission. That's an awesome little account. It's not all that often that you hear of apparitions appearing over water. Not to mention that there's something super spooky about two silent people in a rowboat where they should not be. The submitter's suggestion is an interesting one. It does almost seem like something played out on a loop, rather than simply an intelligent haunting. Perhaps it's a replay of a tragedy at sea many years ago. I'll thank you again for that submission. It's not all that often we get to hear stories that take place in the open ocean. Our next call is a bit of a somber one. The following is an extension from a previous call from Corey in Utah. Hi, Derek. Uh, This is Corey. I called in earlier to talk about my cousin who who had uh, been killed by the police. Um, I shared a couple of experiences that happened after his death, and I just had something happen, and I can't stop thinking about it, and so... I thought that I would call and share. Uh, Tomorrow, I guess it's past midnight where I am now, so today is the third anniversary of his death. And I was thinking about it, and I told myself I decided that I wasn't going to be sad. And I was getting ready for bed tonight, and I was just doing all the normal things, you know, taking the dogs out one more time, and making sure that all the lights are shut off and and the doors are locked and that sort of thing and thinking about my cousin and I had my phone in my pocket and it started to buzz and I pulled it out and while my phone was in my pocket and it opened up my Dropbox app and out of all of the thousands of photographs and memes and craft patterns and all the other stuff that I have saved in, the, in my Dropbox, it had found one of only a handful of pictures of my cousin and opened it up all by itself. Now my phone is really titchy and it does tend to open things when it's in my pocket. I, I quite haven't figured out what the magic positioning is to get it to not do that, but so it's really not unusual for me to pull my phone out and discover that I've ordered something off of Amazon, for instance, or I've sent a nonsensical text messages to random people or that sort of thing. But this is the first time that it's ever pulled up a picture and 
to have it be a picture of my cousin on the anniversary, the day before the anniversary of his death. It could be a coincidence. Logically, I know it probably was. But it feels like so much more than that. And it's something that I'm so grateful to have that that have happened to me. And I'm going to make tomorrow the best day that I can. I'm going to figure out some, some way to do something in his memory that he would appreciate. Anyway, thank you again for your wonderful show. And thank you for letting me share the story. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you, Corey. And again, I am sorry for your loss. I can hear the emotion in Corey's voice. I can tell she wants to believe this is her cousin reaching out from beyond. But I also sense the hesitation. Well, truth be told, I want that for her as well. Of course, there is no way of knowing if that is in fact the case. At least not yet. But it does bring up an important question. A question I ask myself a lot lately given my recent loss. Why is it that some deceased seem to find a way to communicate from beyond, while others remain silent? In other words, if we hear from some, shouldn't we be able to hear from all? Of course, I do not have an answer or even a theory here, but I can't help but think of that each and every time I hear a story like this. So thank you again, Corey. I hope time continues to heal your wounds. And we have one last call to share, but first, allow me to get this out of the way. We still need reviews. Over the past few months, I've been asking, and you guys certainly haven't disappointed. We've gained some 200 reviews since the beginning of the year, but that's simply not enough. To continue to grow, we need the reviews to come in consistently. So if you haven't yet done so, please go to your Apple Podcast app and leave a five-star rating and a few nice words about why you enjoy the podcast. If you use an app that does not allow reviews, then please post something on Facebook sharing the show. And it goes without saying that I appreciate each and every one of you for taking the time out of your busy day to submit. And I'm running low on merchandise, so if there's something in the shop that you want, but I don't have your size or color, please be patient. I'm putting in new orders here shortly. And lastly, I know I'm behind on Patreon content. Last month's video will post next week, as well as this month's first bonus episode. Keeping up with all this has proven to be more challenging than I first expected, but I promise I will get everything posted as soon as possible. All right, now for that final call. Our next and last story for the night comes to us from a region of the world that we haven't heard much from, the Middle East. This is Fatma's call from... Dubai. Hi Derek, my name is Fatma. I am from Dubai, the United Arab Emirates. That's in the Middle East. Um, Well, um, where I come from, basically our culture um, is very deeply into Islam. And in Islam there are two beings, which are angels and jinn. And Jinn actually come in many forms, Uh, some of them are malicious, malevolent, some of them are peaceful, some, uh, they actually even vary through gender and ages. Um, Where I grew up actually was a very super, they were very superstitious people, so Jinn was always talked about, you know. Um, Well, the first story is that a lot of things did happen, but the main one that I'll remember right now or talk about right now is uh, it involves my brother. So every weekend, all of our cousins would come over and basically sleep over for the weekend. And <clears throat> there was a, a we had a playroom. Okay. Um, so I remember that weekend we had dinner and then our parents actually called all of us kids to go to the living room to watch a cartoon, Aladdin I think even. Um, but my brother was the only one that stayed in the playroom because he wanted to play Sonic the Hedgehog. So he was there playing his little game and this playroom had a door to the outside 
to basically the lawn, the front lawn. Um, so he said that it was opened just slightly, um, but he said that it opened like a gust of wind came in, and he said that he saw a shadow on the ceiling, walking on the ceiling, but it was upside down, so its head was basically to the ground and its feet were to the ceiling and he got really freaked out by that he, he um, described the shadow person or the jinn as a young boy because the shadow or the figure of this thing um, wasn't very it didn't look like an adult it looked like a child and he, um, my brother said it was most probably wearing a kandora, which is our traditional clothing for the boys and the men. Um, and he got really freaked out and he just ran out of the, that room and came straight to the living room and basically, basically didn't really talk to us. He was kind of in shock. And when he finally did tell us what happened, no, mm, we didn't really believe him. But after that incident, we, well, especially myself um, and some of my cousins, we did some see some weird things around the house. We would see a boy wearing our traditional clothing, which is a kandora, um, running around. Like literally, you would be in the playroom and you would just see this thing running. Or you would be in the lawn or the play, uh, you know. Um, playing outside in the garden and you would see this thing even in daylight you would see this thing just running and he was a boy he was a bit taller than we were at that age um, I want to say we were under 12 years old maybe he was a bit taller than a t normal 12 year old would be um, but we did see him wearing the kandora because kandoras are white we would see him wearing this white clothing and just whoosh, whoosh whoosh running back and forth and it was really creepy and um, we were always scared to actually just stay alone by ourselves we would always try to be in groups because of that because we didn't know what it wanted so yeah and the thing that I believe this jinn or shadow person tried to communicate with us a bit but not with us specifically the kids but with our mom um, thinking back to it I think maybe the, this thing just wanted to play with us because he would always show himself to us kids um, or just wanted some kind of attention from us or wanted to play with us I don't know but uh, we're, I remember like us telling our mom like oh we would see this boy running, running around the house and she would never believe us she would never believe us so um what started happening with her is that every time when she was sleeping, like it would be the dead of night, she would start hearing this thud on her window. Thud, thud, thud. And she said that she was always too scared to open up the curtains and just see what was banging on her window. Um, but she always would check it the next day. And what she saw were children's handprints all over the window and it was a small child's hand though it was like really small like I remember it was smaller than ours um, and she got really freaked out and she thought we were like playing around with her or our cousins were playing around with her like trying to freak her out but we were always asleep by that time because she said that she would start hearing these thuds around one o'clock to two o'clock in the morning but we were always fast asleep she would check on us and when she would try to go back to sleep she would hear these thuds again the next day she would go check her window and these prints will be all over that her window and um and it couldn't have been us anyways because the window was uh her window was too too high um we would have never reached it unless we like took a ladder or a chair um, in the middle of the night to scare her um, so yeah that's like some things that we've experienced um, we have experienced my brother has experienced um, like something picking him up 
when he was a child. Um, yeah, but that's another story for another day. Thank you, Derek. I really hope you could use this. And I'm excited to call back and just to let you know our other stories. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Fatma. I'm not even going to pretend that I know much about the djinn. I've seen the movie Wishmaster, and I've heard it discussed on a few other podcasts, but truth be told, I'm a bit in the dark here. So instead of me throwing out theories, I decided to explore the origins of the djinn. The following clip comes to us courtesy of YouTube user Lahudsta. The word djinn comes from jan, meaning to hide or conceal. They see us yet they're hidden from view. There's even a chapter in the Quran entitled The Jinn, so their existence is only denied by a deviant few. Allah created jinns from a smokeless fire, as sentient beings invisible to the human eye. Intelligent and with free will like us, jinns live on earth in tribes, eat, marry and die. Jinns even have sects amongst them. In fact, Ibn Kathir reported of jinn who were Rafida Shia. They have believers amongst them too, but it is the devils amongst them that cause panic or fear. Jinns are technologically advanced and lived on earth 2,000 years before mankind, but caused harm. Angels pushed them to desolate areas, so now they coexist in a cloaked parallel life in relative calm. Some jinns can shapeshift into animals, while some crawl on their bellies or fly. Others can appear as humanoids, shadowy dogs, cats, or snakes that slither by. Numerous legends exist of humanoid creatures who transform into animal forms in horror and alarm. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, If you see a ghilan shapeshift before you, banish them by calling the adhan. Devils cause nightmares and sleep paralysis, appearing as night terrors, hags, or ghostly glows. Jinns explain supernatural mysteries like sprites and ghouls, aliens, and many UFOs. Jinns hang about in graveyards, dumps, deserted ruins, and desolate open spaces. Other haunts include filthy toilets, and they lurk in between sunny and shady places. Wish granting jinns in fairy tales like Aladdin's genie and Narnia's witch are just yarns. But children should stay in after dusk to avoid jinns that wander about and their harms. Now the creator of this video seems to take all of this as fact, but of course I suggest you do your own research before buying into all these legends. It almost seems as though the jinn is a bit of a catch-all for any paranormal activity. Sort of the way the boogeyman is here in the States. This certainly is an interesting topic, and if you'd like to learn more, might I suggest episode 26 of Blurry Photos Podcast. Dave and David do a pretty good job of breaking down exactly what the gin is and where it comes from. So thank you again, Fatma, for the call. I love that we're covering topics that aren't as well known here in the U.S. And that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Any audio used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. Additional support is provided by Addie Lloyd and Warren Pond Abbott. Music used in this episode was provided by Mayu, Coag Music, and Nature World 1986. Thank you all for listening, and until next week.